Hi, it's great to see you. So thankful that you are here uh, to worship with us at the 11 a.m. service of our, McAll- of our McAllen campus. If you are uh, in one of our overflow areas in the Fellowship Hall or one of the lobbies, I want to welcome you today. If you're watching online, uh, thankful that you're tuned in from wherever you are. Why don't you grab your Bible if you have one with you and open to uh, Hebrews chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there might be one underneath the seat in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, that would be our gift to you today. Uh, And the text will be on the screen here in just a minute when we jump into it. Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to continue our series entitled Jesus is Better, right? Well, Jesus is better than what? Everything, right? That's what we're talking about. That's what the book of Hebrews teaches us, that Jesus is better than everything. And so we're going to continue on this morning. Before we jump into the text here in a few minutes, I want to celebrate a few things with you. We're a church that likes to celebrate things. If you're a guest with us, just don't get freaked out if we start clapping and stuff. We're, we're happy. You go to some churches and it feels like you're at a funeral. You're like, where's the body? Um, I don't mean that disrespect. I'm just saying it's like, you know. Anyways, um, but, but we think that there's a place for reverence uh, for a holy God, but we also think there's a place for celebrating what God has done. And so just a few things. Pastor Marshall already mentioned our daddy-daughter dance Over 200 daddies and daughters here in McAllen. Um, But also, uh, also somewhere north of 30, last night in Alice, for Alice campus, they had their own daddy-daughter dance. Reached out to the community there. And so, great time. Uh, Some other exciting things. Last weekend was a huge weekend in the life of our church. Last weekend, uh, over 2,800 people gathered to worship at one of the four BT campuses. Over 2,800 people last weekend. It is our largest weekend outside of Easter in the history of our church. And two of our campuses, two of our campuses had record Sundays with Alice and Sherryland both having their highest attended Sundays um, ever. And so we celebrate that. And and then the last thing I just want to celebrate with you guys, um, if you've been around, uh, you know that uh, 2019 is is our highest uh, operating budget year in the history of our church. And if you don't have like a, a church background, you're a guest today, uh, just we don't like go on and on about money, and if you you know really kind of clueless with church, we, we we have an operating budget. We have you know lights are on right now, and there's an air conditioner. That's a good thing, right in the valley. So there there are there are expenses, the personnel, all that stuff, and this is our highest year, about highest budget ever. And last year was our highest budget ever, and the year before that was our highest budget because we're growing, right? Um, and and I've shared that there was some angst in the preparation of the 2019 budget uh, because of the increase. We're at uh, three and a half million dollars for this year. Uh, and that, that goes to support the needs of our campuses, our personnel. Uh, we still have 29 missionaries we support worldwide, uh, plus other off-campus causes we give to, from Bible schools to church plants in New York, to church plants right here in the Valley, and others. Uh, and, and so we talked about this, and uh, one of the things that we've said this year is we're going we're gonna to take the opportunity to teach about the, the gift of tithing, right? The the, 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 the gift that, that it is when we surrender our finances to the Lord. And, and I've said this, and ultimately, you, you just have to take my word for it. We're not going to teach, uh, and we're going to do it in different ways. Last week, we had a, a video testimony from Miss Candy Reed. It was amazing. Uh, we'll have more of those, and you can catch them online if you miss them. Um, but but it, it's, it's not out of compulsion, like, oh, we have this budget. We're scared we're not going to meet it. It's not out of that, because Jesus said in the New Testament that he's going to build his church. And, and his church, the gates of hell, don't prevail against it, right? So as long as we build his church, we're good. I mean, if, if we don't meet the budget, it's really kind of irrelevant. That's ancillary. He's going to provide. If it's lean, if it's blessing, if it's hard times, if, it, if it's good times, he's going to build his church. And so, and so it's not out of compulsion that, oh, we want to keep this before you all the time. It's out of the fact that we have a lot of new people at BT. And one of the things with being new to the church or new to faith, a lot of new believers as well, is we, we grow in our faith. And one area that's critical to grow in is our surrender to God. We're not meant to be independent. We're meant to be dependent upon him. And the bottom line brass tax truth is that one of the biggest ways we practice our dependence upon God is with our finances, right? I mean, we can come on Sundays, we can serve, we can talk, we can, but, 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 but a lot of times for Christians, there's a separation between what we say and what we do. So that's why we want to take 2019 to make it a year of teaching about the, the actual blessing of trusting God. That being said, I want to celebrate. Um, you know, there's a saying, maybe some of you know how this goes. There's a saying that says when it, when it comes to eating an elephant, the best way to do it is what? Why would you eat an elephant, you sicko? No, uh, <laughs> I'm calling, no, yeah, one, one, one bite at a time, right? It's the best, well, the best way to meet your new budget that's the highest in the history of your church is to meet it one month at a time, right? One, one month tracking along, and so what I want to celebrate with, with y'all is we're in the first Sunday of February, 
and I don't have the exact figures, so I don't want to misspeak, but, but we more than met our January 2019 budget need. Um, we're, we are most likely somewhere north of actually $50,000 over the need. Uh, and so um, it's, it was a great month. And now we're in February, and we're going to continue to see what God has for us. So I say that to say, first off, praise God for his faithfulness. And, and it, it's so awesome to be a part of a church where we come together trusting the Lord uh, and believing that he has more to do, right? There, there, there are more people in South Texas that need to hear the gospel. And so there's more churches that need to get planted. There's more BT campuses that need to get opened. There's uh, more missionaries that need to be sent out. And so I'm thankful uh, that one month in, one out of 12, right, um, we, we are continuing to be an obedient church to the Lord to see uh, his message go out. All right. That being said, we're going to jump into Hebrews chapter 2. We're looking at one verse today. Uh, you're like, how could you possibly talk for 40 minutes about one verse? Just watch. Uh, it won't be 40. It'll probably be 45. Anyways, um, no, but, but we're in one verse. Last week, if you missed it, you can catch, you can catch it online. Last week in verses 5 through 9 of Hebrews chapter 2, we talked about the fact that Jesus is better because he provides for us a better destiny. And that word destiny, it's kind of been hijacked in our current society because there are preachers out there that they say, hey, look, God has a destiny for you. And if you send me enough money, uh, that destiny will be health and wealth and riches beyond compare. Just make sure you send me the money. Did I mention send me money, right? And, and so there's this, this philosophy or really there's this theology that, that if I love God enough and send God's people enough money, then he's going to make sure I never get sick and I'm never broke. That's, that's my destiny. And so the word's been hijacked, but we don't have to be scared. We should bring it back because God does have a destiny for us. See, see, Jesus bought back our destiny with his death on the cross, but the destiny he bought back for us is actually our original destiny. See, when God created humanity, he created them to live in perfect relationship with him, underneath him, but having dominion over the earth. Dominion literally means to, to get the best out of something. We were meant under God's sovereignty to get the best out of the earth. Kings and queens of God's creation. But humanity chose sin. And in, instead of destiny, we got destruction, right? And th there was the split between man and God that couldn't be fixed by us. We, we, we could not get back to God. And so he made a way, and that was through Jesus. So last week we talked about the fact that our, our destiny a better destiny is provided through Jesus. Today, what we're going to do, actually, is we're going we're to take verse 10, connect it to the previous passage, and really all of Hebrew so far, and we're going to see how Jesus is the one who's capable to do that, right? He, he bought back our destiny. Well, who, who says he can do that? What's his resume? Why is he qualified to be the one who accomplishes our destiny? Why is he the one, what I'm going to say a lot today, he's the one who recreates. I, I say it this way, the, the story of redemption is the story of the God who creates and recreates for his glory and our good. You see, God is recreating because when, when God accomplished victory through Jesus and his death on the cross and his victorious resurrection, the truth is, God, see, God didn't just defeat sin and death and Satan. He defeated them so much so that it's like they were never there. It, see, it, it's a complete recreation for all of those who place their faith in him. He's, he's redoing, restoring what once was. And Jesus is the one who is completely equipped, entirely appropriate, as we'll see in the text, to accomplish this on behalf of God the Father. Now, let me, let me say this. What we're going to talk about today is how Jesus is a better pioneer, right? A better trailblazer. Um, think for a minute about where you are, where you're, where you're sitting, and think about what, what all went in for you to be able to be here. To, now, I, I don't mean, well, I woke up and that was, a, no, I mean, beyond ourselves. Like, yeah, we got up, we got dressed, you know, brushed our teeth, right? If you didn't, don't close talk me today, all right? Like, <laughs> this is the distance you got to keep. But anyways, not, not our personal selves, but think about what went in to make today a reality. Like, just to make today a reality, there's a lot of people who practiced, who rehearsed and instruments and vocals across, again, four campuses. There's a lot of people that, 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 that put in time for uh, production technical elements so we could have words on the screen. Uh, there, there was a, a thermostat set so it would be cool when we showed up. But, but not just that. There was a sermon that was written. I'm getting there. Anyways, um, but, but not just that. I mean, here, here in McAllen, some of you don't remember these days because you're, you're new to the church, but, but four years ago, this room got remodeled, right? I mean, some of us remember the blue carpet days, right? Blue carpet, blue pews. 
And, and four years ago, it's not just that there was blue carpet, blue pews. There was no Sherry Land, Edinburgh, or Alice campus. But, but, but not just that. So, so like four years ago, this room was remodeled. A lot of thought and preparation went into it. These chairs that we sit in were purchased. But, but all of that still is predicated because some 34 years ago in 1985, a group of believers felt called by God to start a church in North McAllen, and they didn't have a whole lot of support in the process. People thought that there didn't need to be a church up here. Like that, This is not a strategic place for a church in 1985, but by God's grace and with his vision, they, they blazed a trail. They pioneered a vision so that 30, you know, 34 years later, 2,800 people could meet inside a radius of 100 miles plus 29 missionaries worldwide and church plants to boot. And, and that, that goes back to that vision 34 years ago. But that vision 34 years ago only came about. Those pioneers could only pioneer and blaze the trail because they had placed their faith in the ultimate pioneer, Jesus. See, the, 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 the path to get back to Jesus, now I said, be, if you're going to clap, you got to do it. I mean, you're messing with my emotions. If the, the path to get back to Jesus could only be blazed by himself. Otherwise, humanity would be left wanting. And, and I'm going to say this a lot throughout the sermon today. If you are here today or you're watching online, or you're in overflow somewhere, and you, you're here today and you are unsure about the God thing. You're unsure because of your own doubts, whatever. You're unsure because you, you, you think you're doing enough good. You know, like you, you show up some. You're overall a pretty good guy or girl. Uh, and you, you, you just kind of think that in the end the scales will probably balance in your favor. I'm going to say on the front end, that's a false hope. It's not going to work out. But the good news is there's been a trail that's been blazed by Jesus. He has pioneered a path that when we place our faith in him, we indeed can be brought back to God. And I think what we're going to see in this verse uh, this morning is is why he's able to do so. Now, now let me say this also. There's a lot of us, we've, we've got church background. We're what I call churchies, right, you know. So, so kind of pull back your Sunday school answers and just listen to me for a second. If we're really honest, Jesus the trailblazer in a lot of ways doesn't make sense. What do you mean? Imagine you were told that you were going to have an opportunity to meet the king of the world. I don't mean Leonardo DiCaprio on the Titanic, right? I mean the actual king of the world. You're like, I don't even know what that means. Like, There's a president in my country. I've heard of kings and dictators. But, but anyways, you get this formal invitation. You're going to have a, have a chance to meet the king of the world. So you start thinking about what do you do in preparation? Like, What do you wear? Is that a suit and tie, tuxedo, cocktail dress? I don't even know what that is. And you, you start fretting over what you're going to wear, and then you start getting excited. I, mean, I can't imagine what we're going to eat at this thing, but it's the king of the world. I, that got to be some good food. And then you start dreaming of the dignitaries, the world leaders. Maybe you don't know who the king of the world is, but you know this one world leader, and you'd really like to, to meet him or her, right? And so you're, you're building an anticipation. And then the day of the event, you, you, you are provided with a, a personal escort to help get you to the introduction. And you've got four outfits laid out. You're like, look, I, I don't even know what this thing's going to be like. Like, is it black tux? Is it, you know, casual sweater? Like, wh- where, 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 where do I go here? And, and the escort's like, look, it doesn't really matter. Just kind of what you have on is fine. You're like, I just worked out. You're like, it's fine. And then you're getting ready to leave. And then and, and the person who's going to escort you to the introduction says, hey, you might want to grab a bite to eat before you leave. You're like, well, I would like seven course meal. I mean, like, no, you might want to grab a granola bar or something because you could get hungry. And then, and then you're led out on the trip, and you end up, where you end up is not some royal palace, some, some regal hall. Where you end up is some back alley with the stench of death. And the person that's been guiding you takes you by the shoulder and says, look, look, down, look, look down the way. And you look, you look down the alley, and, and there's a clearing out there. And at the end of this dark, stinky alley, there's a man bleeding to death gasping for air he's being executed charged as a criminal what's his crime clinging a ki- claiming a kingship that he doesn't have and your guy grabs you and says look you see that man down there there he is that's the king of the world nothing would seem right would it why is why is the king of the world being executed for claiming his own kingship why is he naked and suffocating 
on an instrument of death next to criminals. You, wait, he, he's God's king of the world? How in the world does God allow that to happen to his king? This is not appropriate. This is, this is, this is not logical. And what we're going to find out today, because again, I'm, I'm not being blasphemous. That's re, that, that doesn't make sense. Let's just be honest. All the churches in the room, let's just pull back the truth. On paper, it doesn't make sense. So how does the bleeding, suffocating Jesus crucified on a cross, how is that appropriate that he is the one? We have to remember that, that God said, I'm going to choose what is foolish in the eyes of man to confound the wise. I, it's not going to be your ways. R- remember historically that the nation of Israel, the people that were called God's people, they, they were anticipating a king, just not Jesus. They thought it would be a military power restoring Israel to a world power. They, they were looking for a second David. They, they didn't know they should be looking for a second Adam. And, and, and today, what have you see, what ends up happening is parameters get placed on Jesus that are just too small. Israel said, we need David, to, the son of David, to come and reclaim the throne. We've been under oppression for hundreds of years. We haven't had a national identity. We need to get back to conquering and, and, and claiming land. And they had parameters that were just too small. Today, the same thing happens, right? Well, I can't, I mean, I can't trust God. If, if God's so good, why do bad things happen? You know what that is? That's not a philosophical, theological problem. Those are parameters that are too small for a, for a big God. Well, I, I can't trust God because bad things happen. Let me just, if that's where you are, I don't want you to be offended. I'm glad you're here. If where you are, it's like, I can't, I'm agnostic. Uh, I'm atheist about this. I can't trust God because you say he's good and bad things happen. Well, you're not trusting him. What does that do to the bad things? Does it change anything? You're like, okay, well, what does your trusting do? It changes everything. You will never hear me say that by trusting God, I no longer have bad days. What you will hear me say is that I have bad days in victory. I have bad days with him by my side. It changes every. It's parameters. You got, you, you got to take the parameters off. Well, I, if, if God's so good, why does this happen? And, and, and we're, we're, we're putting fences around God and making him much smaller. What I alluded to earlier. If God's good, he's going to make sure that I don't get the flu this season. If he's good, he's going to make sure that I don't go broke. If he's, if he's good, all these things are going to happen, and we're putting parameters. So when, when I do go broke, never mind that, you know, I've, I've overcharged my credit card, or when I do get sick, you didn't get the flu shot, or, you know, I mean, whatever it is, when, when things don't happen, well, well, then God doesn't measure up anymore, but we've placed small parameters on him. But when God willingly subjects himself to humanity, I'm going to talk about that in a second, when he puts on flesh and he lives a perfect life and he willingly dies on a cross and, and through what should be defeat and despair and destruction, he brings victory, life, and freedom, the game changes. So what we're going to find out, how, how is Jesus better than angels and priests and prophets and kings? How is Jesus able to buy back our destiny? He has the perfect resume for the job. And that's what we're going to see today in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. This is what the text says. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, (coughs) it was entirely appropriate. Everybody say entirely appropriate. That God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Let's pray. Father, this morning I pray you open our hearts and minds to receive from you. I pray that you would communicate your word clearly today. God, I pray for those that feel despair and brokenness, that they would know the peace that comes from knowing Jesus. Father, for believers that have aligned their lives to Christ, let them be reminded of their identity in Christ. And for those that are far from you today, King Jesus, would you draw them to yourself, call them by name, and let today be their day of salvation. We pray that you are glorified today and your church is blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get to it. Why is Jesus a better pioneer, right? That's what we're t- Why is he a better pioneer? Why is he better than what we can think of? The first thing, he's a better pioneer because he is perfectly equipped for the job, right? He's perfectly equipped for the job. We've all seen someone have a task to perform or, 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 or a job to fulfill, and the bottom line is they just weren't equipped for it. At the end of the day, they could not pull it off because whether it's the training and education that was necessary or the internal skills, the natural abilities, but for whatever reason, they weren't able to perform the task because they just weren't equipped. Now, let me prepare you. This is an extremely elementary point I'm about to make. 
So, you know, I know you're used to me blowing your mind, but this time it may not happen, all right? Why is Jesus perfectly equipped for the job? First and foremost, because he himself is God. What what did the text say in verse 10? For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist. Now, again, that's extremely elementary, right? Well, Jesus is God. Thanks for that one, Chris. But this is why it's actually worth stating. Because for all of us here or online or in Overflow that that are believers, that have placed our faith in Jesus and received the work of salvation applied to our lives, think about all the things that you let derail your faith, your joy, and your peace. And then think about the fact that you have access to God. Oh, well, that's not a mind-blowing point. It sure isn't. But if we would believe it a little bit more, our lives would be a little more faithful, wouldn't they? He's, he's God. Paul wrote to the church uh, in Colossae. He, he said that all things created by him, for him, and through him. John chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. If you read John chapter 1, take the word Word and replace it with Jesus. Word? All right. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was Jesus. And the Word was God. Jesus was God. And the Word was with God. Jesus was with God. Why is he equipped for this monumental job? Because he's God himself. He's the perfect fit. That's what everything that we've studied up to this point tells us. He's better than angels. He's perfectly equipped. He's better than prophet, priests, and kings. He, he, he's above all things. He put everything in place. He can accomplish our destiny. He can buy it back because he himself is the God that all things are created through. And it is completely, entirely appropriate that God accomplish redemption and salvation through Jesus because doing so is in line with his goodness. Jesus is perfectly equipped for the job of ushering in recreation, of of restoring what was lost the righting of the wrongs of sin. He is perfectly equipped for this job. Not only that, but but Jesus was also perfectly obedient in the job. When the task, he, he, was, he was equipped for it because he's God himself, eternally preexistent, right? He's got all those things, but, but, but he also was perfectly obedient in the job. Paul writes to the Philippian church. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to flip over to Philippians chapter 2 and read a few verses for you. So what what Paul says to the church at Philippi. This is speaking of Jesus' obedience in the job, to the job. He says in verse 5 of Philippians 2, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Now, let me explain that. You're like, what does that mean? What he is saying when it says existing in the form of God, he's literally saying he is God. N- not, not form of like a type. Like he, he, he exists in the form of, as, as God exists. But yet, even though he is God, he doesn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. You confused? I am. Let's keep going. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't consider equality with God something to be exploited. You know why that's an important line? We are not God. We are created in his image, though. The only part of creation, created in God's image. But yet humanity has this tendency to take our creation in God's image and exploit it, to grasp it. He goes on to say, instead, in, instead of considering equality with himself, something to be exploited and grasped, he, he emptied himself. By assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let let me talk about that just for a second. What is happening here? Okay, so let me talk about Jesus, right? Jesus is God. We've established that point. So so all these fancy words, right, they get get attributed to Jesus. He's eternally preexistent. What does that mean? He has always been there, has no beginning. He is, word that I've talked about before, he is immutable, not he doesn't stop talking. He does not change. It's impossible for change. There's no shadow of turning within him, as one writer of the hymn would say. He's unchanging. He's not fickle like a man. 
He's eternally preexistent. He's immutable. He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He knows everything. He's more powerful than anything, and he's everywhere. Okay, that's Jesus. That's Jesus, right? But even though that's who he is, he didn't consider that something to be exploited, so he therefore empties himself, right? If I took the lid off this bottle, I hope it's tight, and I poured it upside down. Need to look up real quick there. And I pour it upside down, right? Then it would begin to empty itself. A natural question is what did Jesus empty himself of? Now let me make a disclaimer. This is my commentary, okay? I believe at least part of, we won't know in full, part of what Jesus emptied himself of willingly, wasn't taken from him, were those big word traits, He put on, how do I, why do I believe that? Because when he came to earth, he became an infant. People who are possessing and displaying omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence typically don't need to be fed, changed, and napped. He willingly, willingly, okay? And so then he grows in stature and becomes a man. And what does he do? He works. He has a job. And then what happens as he's a man? He still has to eat and sleep. And so he's subjected himself willingly to this. And then even though he lives the only perfect human life, denies sin in his humanity every day, all day, then he willingly submits himself to death, not just death, but a criminal's execution on a cross. Again, well, that doesn't make sense, right? How is that the king of the world? Well, let's see why that makes sense. For this reason. What reason? For the emptying of himself. For the obedience. Not, 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 not for the display of power. Not, not, not for the, the, the conquering of lands. But for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's perfectly obedient In the job, he submits himself as God to the will of God. He, through his obedience, ultimately pioneers life and freedom. Through his suffering, he ushers in hope. Now, I know sometimes that doesn't connect with us. Why why does it not connect with us? Because believers and non-believers alike, you know what we're, we're prone to do? We are prone to view suffering exclusively as heartache and evil. Something that happens because we did something to bring it upon ourselves. We're we're prone to avoid it. Now, let me be clear. I am not advocating, and there's not a biblical principle for becoming some type of narcissist that says, man, I I hope I suffer today. Like, in fact, when I go to bed, I'm actually going to move my bed four inches over, and I'm going to go to sleep and forget I did that. I'm going to wake up and stub my toe. Praise God for that. (laughs) I'm pretty sure I'm going to wait till church lets out, and I'm just going to, like, run back and forth across Trenton. Just... Well, G- Jesus is my Savior. You better hope he's your traffic cop, too. I mean, it's, it's not foolishness that we apply. But we, as I said earlier, for those that question God's existence because bad things are in the world, bad things are in the world. For the believer, guess what? Bad things still happen. Suffering. You know what suffering becomes? This is super encouraging, right? Suffering becomes our traveling companion. Good news, right? Wee. But... Some of you know the answer to this because you've been around for a while. Suffering also has a what? Expiration date. Jesus made it clear in the 21st chapter of Revelation when John in his vision says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth because former things had passed away. And in this new earth, man, there's no mourning and there's no pain and there's no death because all those former things, guess what? They've died. Death has died. And and then Jesus says, check this out. He said, behold, but I like to say, check this out. Check this out. I made all things, what? New. So suffering has an expiration date, but it's not just that. It's not just, well, I'm just going to suffer until I get there. The expiration date hasn't hit yet, okay? But in Jesus' perfect obedience 
to the job. When we place our faith in him, we have the promise of the expiration date of suffering, but we don't miss this. It's not just then, it's now and then. It's now and not yet. While we wait for suffering to expire, we may face it today, but we will face it in victory. The suffering you face, don't miss this. If you have Jesus, you face it in victory, not in defeat. If you don't have Jesus, I don't have any good words for you. Face it in defeat right now. So in his obedience, he ushers this in. And when we only view suffering as this negative reality that's always for our harm, we miss what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just make the good days good. He made the bad days good. He gave victory over the total package. So we can have heartache, and we can, go th- we, we, can, we can lose a loved one, and there can be marital strife, and th- th- we, we can have sickness and, and financial issues, and we don't long for those things, but we trust Jesus to be victorious in those things. So that guess what happens? Regardless what the sickness does, we still have victory. When, when, when everyone says there is absolutely zero hope for that marriage to be restored, we say, you know what, I think Jesus has a different word for that. When, when, when these things happen, because of the perfect obedience that Jesus has to the job. What, what, what does the, the text say? Go back to Hebrews 2. It says it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect through what? Sufferings. Jesus is the source of our salvation. And because of that, we, we, we can endure suffering and trial and temptation because Jesus has pioneered a path that allows us to do that. He, the text says that he's brought many sons and daughters to glory, and then check this out, and, and then it says, so, so that God would make the source, that's Jesus, source, you could, you could say author, pioneer, the author, the pioneer of our salvation would, made him, would make him perfect, you with me? Make him perfect through sufferings. Hold on, Jesus is God. How does, how does the perfect God get made perfect, right? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> it's entirely appropriate. How, how, Jesus wasn't lacking in perfection. The, the text isn't actually saying he got made perfect. It's kind of like the end of Philippians 2 there, that section where it says he became obedient to the point of death, and because of that, God then gave him the name above Every name gave him the name that every knee will bow at and every tongue will confess to. And so it's not that Jesus got made perfect. It's that he is, wait for it, more perfect than perfect. That doesn't make sense. Welcome to the club. He's called God, guys. (laughs) He's more perfect than perfect. Perfect doesn't do the job to describe him. He is better, check this out, he is better than a perfect pioneer. And he's... He is this because he was perfectly obedient in the job. And let me make this last point before we move on. Jesus perfectly completed the job. Jesus perfectly, it's not just that he was perfectly equipped, had the right stuff, you know. It's not just he was perfectly obedient that he submitted and subjected himself. He finished the job. We call it the completed work of of Christ. We we I, I pointed to it in Colossians 1 and John 1. He, he's equipped. Philippians 2, he was obedient. And because of that, he completed it. That's why we can say what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Well, I consider that these sufferings are really minuscule. They're nothing compared to to knowing Jesus, the, 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 the glory of knowing Jesus because he finished the job. Let, let me say this. Jesus di- did not halfway do the job. Jesus didn't do a job to where he would say, okay, I've done my part. Make sure you get baptized. It's important, right? It's a command. Make sure that, you know, parents, make sure you, you baptize your children when they're infants and, and make, make sure you go to church, make sure you get baptized as an adult, make sure you give. Make, make, no, he didn't say, I did most of it. Jesus from the cross, some of you know, Jesus did not declare, it is mostly finished. It is 99% done. If you guys could just help me out. No, he said definitively completed action. It is what? Finished. Nothing else to be done. He sat down. He was so done. He, he completed the necessary work to recreate what humanity broke through sin. 
he completed the necessary work to bring us back to salvation. He has the resume required. He, he was obedient and he completed the job. Now you say, Chris, that's, that's cool. That's good information. But so what, right? Our desire at BT is we don't just want to preach and get some information is important, by the way. We, we'll preach the whole counsel of God. We're not going to preach to itching ears. Make sure you feel good when you leave. But it's not just what we want you to know. It's what, what, do, you, what do you need to do? And so let me give you some so what's, okay? Because, because Jesus is a better pioneer, and, and in being a better pioneer, he's also provided a better path. He's provided a, a better trajectory through which we can live our lives. So what does that mean? What is the path that he's provided? as the source of our salvation, the, the, the trail that he has blazed, what does it do? It allows us to move in some specific ways. When we place our faith in Christ, we're able to move in some specific ways that's a better path for us. Here, here's the first thing I'll say. We're allowed, to move, we're, we're, allowed we're, we're able to move from fear to peace. Because of Jesus, we're able to move from fear to peace. Anyone who does not know Jesus is trapped in fear. Maybe you're like, I don't think I know Jesus. I'm not, I'm not scared. You are. Like, you may not be scared of snakes or something, but you're, you're scared of what is unknown if you're honest with yourself. But in Jesus, we're able to move from fear to peace. You know what's heartbreaking? It's heartbreaking that there are people that have yet to place their faith in Jesus, right? I shared some research when, when we had our volunteer training called Equip, that there's 1.3 million people in the Rio Grande Valley, and statistically it's, it's pretty, pretty safe to say about a million of those don't know Jesus yet. That's heartbreaking, that that many people don't know the peace that Jesus offers. But you know what is, is candidly almost equally heartbreaking? The number of believers that still choose to walk back to fear. Set free, I'm going to get a real preacher here, check out this alliteration, blood-bought, born-again believers, that's a lot of bees. You're like, I don't know what that means. People who have received the gift of salvation set free from the chains of fear to walk in peace. And they, they get set free and something happens in life. They get a little removed from their salvation. Some bad things happen. It's like, I got to go back to this, this fear cage. I don't know how to operate. And so we go back and we limit ourselves. We, we get trapped with anxiety and worry. Now, now let me clarify something. In the broken world we live in, there are some of us. And the anxiety that we battle, it's almost beyond ourselves. It's, this, it's, it's a clinical condition, right? And there's, there's needed professional help and maybe even medication. I want, you, I want you to be clear. I'm not speaking about that. In this broken world, there's things like clinical depression and anxiety, just like there's things like cancer. I mean, there's, there's things that get subjected to us because the world is broken. I'm not speaking about that. Although Jesus provides peace and freedom over that as well. But what I'm talking about is, is the person who, who continues to just worry and, and, and live in anxiety over every little thing. It, it's, and maybe even say, as a believer, you say, you know what, I really don't have a lot of struggles. I mean, things are going well in my marriage. I'm, I'm not looking at stuff online I shouldn't look at. My finances are straight. I don't have any struggles. I just worry a lot. Eh, you might have a struggle. <laughs> See, he, he died to set us free from that. Beloved, if you know Jesus, you can move from fear to peace. The fear that grips you doesn't have to grip you because the victory that Jesus accomplished has already been applied to your life. Paul, Paul didn't write to the, to the church in Rome, hey, here's, here's who we are in Jesus. In, in Jesus, you're kind of sort of almost, almost a conqueror. Except for when things get rough. Then you got No, he says in Jesus, you're not a conqueror. You're not an overcomer. You're a more than conqueror. You're an over, overcomer. You know, there's that song that's real big, I'm an overcomer. I, like, I'm not hating on the song. But, you know, a better lyric would have actually been, I'm an over, overcomer. I know that's like maybe not good lyrically, like the CD scratch or something. But that's what Paul says. He says you're, he, he says more than conqueror. More than an overcomer, not in our own right and might, but because of Jesus. We can move from fear to peace. We can move from lies to truth. Now, let me talk about how twisted this one gets, all right? Um, this is going to be like, this is like a, a mind-bending riddle, so stay with me. This is what Satan has done. <laughs> he's, taken, he's taken a truth and, and caused us to want to believe it's a lie. What's that? What's the truth? You're not good enough, right? Be before we place our faith in Jesus, Satan's taken that truth. And he's like, don't believe that. 
Don't believe you are good enough. You're smart enough and people like you, right? I mean, don't, 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 don't buy into that. But let me just set us all free. There's not a person in the room good enough. Our pride fights it. I put myself in the, in the group. You're like, well, you don't know me. I don't have to. <laughs> it's the truth. But we can be set free from that because guess what? We are not good enough, but Jesus is. He's the one who completed the work that we couldn't complete. All right. Clap it up. Let's go. Okay. So then, so then we, we, we acknowledge the truth that we're not good enough. It's not a lie. We're not good enough. So then, then this is what happens. We, we receive Jesus by grace through faith. That gets applied to our life. So then we cross that bridge. Now Satan flips the script, right? Some of you know what I'm about to say, and, and you know it's true in your life. Now that you've received Jesus, Satan still says, guess what? You're not good enough. But guess what? Now it's a lie. When Jesus takes over your heart, it is no longer true that you're not good enough. Again, in the eighth chapter of Romans, we are told that we are co-heirs with Jesus. Is Jesus good enough? Is someone who is a co-heir with Jesus good enough? It says we are sons and daughters by adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. We cry out, Daddy, are sons and daughters of God good enough? Well, I'll keep going if that's the, yes, you will, because of Jesus, don't misunderstand, it's not prosperity preaching, because of Jesus, you will be more than an overcomer. Is more than an overcomer good enough? Did we do any of it? No, Jesus did, but standing in Christ, as we stand in Christ, we can stand, and Satan can say, you're not good enough. You can say, you were right, but not anymore. You were right, but not anymore. I've been moved. I've been moved from not good enough, not because I did anything, and I'll even not because I'm worth it, but but God deemed my redemption to be worth his glory. So he sent Jesus, and it didn't seem right, but it's actually entirely appropriate. And Jesus died on a cross, and when I placed my faith in him, I didn't do anything. When I placed my faith in him, he says, you're mine. And when he says, you're mine, I'm now good enough. I move from lies to truth, and because of that, because of that, I'll also move from death to life. I'll move from death to life. It's life eternal, but, but don't let it be just, and I don't mean to minimize this, it's not just pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. You move from death to life. There are some, some people in this room, and, 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 you're, and you're married, and it's falling apart, and you believe it's over. If you would surrender that to God, you can take that marriage from death to life. Now hear me, it's not just saying, well, it's yours, Jesus, I'm just going to trust you to do some good stuff. It's actively pursuing it. It's saying we need to get some counseling. It, it's, it's not husbands staying, sitting there and being like, well, once my wife gets it figured out, it'll be good. She's probably not the problem. Um, you just realize you don't want counseling with me. But anyways, we have other good counselors. <laughs> but it's not saying, well, she'll figure it out or he'll figure it out. It's saying I will, I will die to myself to make this right. Because, because what I understand is that in God's gift, it's a gift. In God's gift of marriage, it's not about what I feel. It's not a contract I've signed. It's a covenant I've given myself to. And it may require some sacrifice, but as you walk the road of sacrifice, what ends up happening is fullness. Some of you, you're like, my, my finances are a complete wreck. I've been out of work for weeks, months, years. I'm not making light of the situation. And so you're, you're, you're standing in death. You, it's affecting your family. Your finances are falling apart. But you're saying to yourself, this happens. I've heard it, been serving church for 20 years. One of the most frustrating things, and I'll just be candid. I get more frustrated with men. Well, I, I, you know, I've been out of work for 24 months, but God has a job for me, and I'm just waiting for it. Meanwhile, in the waiting, six opportunities have come your way. Like, well, that's not the job for me. Brother, you need to work. Maybe it's not your future career, but it, it, it pays. And so we don't sit back and say, well, God's going to work it out. He is going to work it out, and he expects you to walk alongside him in the working. And you, and you move from death to life, and, and, and there's freedom. And Jesus is the one that can actually do it. He's, he's the only one that can actually do it. So what do we do? Right? So what? Okay, I, I want to move from fear to peace. I, I want to move from lies to truth. I want to move from death to life. 
what, what do we do? A few things. There are some of you in this room, you, you have faith in Christ. Maybe you're watching online. You have faith in Christ. You, you have new life. But you have gone back to the prison, the cage of fear and, and the cage of lies and the cage of death even. And so this is, this is like, this is legit. I mean, we, we sometimes we want to believe that it's always God writing in the sky or when I go to Coco's, my tortilla will have a picture of, you know. Sometimes, guess what? Sometimes it's actual discipline. <laughs> if, if that happens, I'm totally Instagramming that, by the way. But <laughs> sometimes, though, it's actual discipline. And so some of us that are captivated by fear, you know what you actually need to do? Today, you need to get a pen and paper, the notes app on your phone, whatever, and you need to list the things, the fears that paralyze you. Actually list them. I don't like not, not snakes. I always go to snakes. I'm scared of snakes. Anyways, I'm, I mean the fear of failure. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the fear of not being enough. I mean the fear of my past coming back to haunt me, that, that abuse. I mean these fears that keep you in a prison that Jesus already let you. I mean the door is open. List them, actually write it down and give it to him. Some of us, you need to identify the patterns that don't reflect the pioneer of Jesus. What do you mean? I mean, some of us, we want to walk in peace and we want to walk in victory. We want to walk in truth, but you just want to walk in it with your pet sin. You can't do it. You cannot do it. I want my marriage to be blessed. You, that, yes, God can do, can do that. He's probably not going to do it when you're looking at porn all the time. I want God, here, I mean, here it is, I want God to bless my finances. He's more than able to do that. Now let me just, there may be like a few people I hadn't offended yet, so let me. Some of us, we, we look at somebody and we say, man, God has blessed them and they got all this money and they got all this stuff. And why, do, why doesn't God bless me that way? It is possible he doesn't bless you that way because he can't trust you with his stuff. But sometimes we say, well, God, I, I just want you to bless me like so-and-so. I, I, I want you to do that in my life. Yet you continue to rob him of the tithe. you gotta, you, you got to let go of those patterns. What, what are the things? And I know it's scary, right? It's, it's a lie. Satan says you bring that in the light, people are going to judge you. You bring that in the light, your wife will definitely leave you. You bring that in the light, you'll definitely get fired. You, you bring that in the light, and those things might actually happen. But he's bigger than that. And the light is freedom. Some of us, let me just say this, you know, it says that, that, that Jesus brought many sons and daughters to glory. I'm just going to ask you a simple, who are you bringing? Who are you telling about Jesus? It amazes me sometimes as believers, we want to be like Jesus in so many ways, except for the part where it involves bringing people to him. In your family, in your workplace, in your community, on your team, at your school, who are you telling about Jesus? Who, who are you going to bring? You know where I'm going? Who are you going to bring next Sunday to church? I'm done celebrating 2,800. I'm ready for 3,800, all right? Who, who, who are we bringing? And then let, let, me, let me close with this. Some of us, all of that, you're ready for it to be applied to your life, peace and truth and life but you have yet to surrender your heart to Jesus. You, you have yet to, to, to pray, to, to, to say, Jesus, I can't do it, and I need you to save me. But if you'll do that today, guess what? Those things start to happen. I'm going to ask our ministers to come forward. We're going to have a time of worship. As they make their way forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to stand. And as you do, I'm just going to ask you to do, uh, do me a favor real quick. We're done. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. I just want to ask you a question right now. You, you may need to make a list. You may need to identify some patterns. You may need to think about who you're going to invite, who you're going to tell about Jesus. But I want to talk to those people that maybe are here and they have yet to surrender their life to Jesus, receiving salvation. I just want to talk to those people. Every, every head bow, every head closed. Let me just ask you a question. As you think about your life and your eternity, here's my question do you know that you know Jesus? Do you know that you know Jesus? If you're unsure, if you're unsure if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, you can have it today and it's free. But he doesn't force himself upon us. 
we have to choose to surrender. And so I, I want to pray over you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything, but if that's you, if you'd say, I don't know that I know Jesus, but I want you to pray for me, would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? Just, just pick it up real quick. Just hold it just for a second. I see you. Just hold it just for a second. Anybody else? Another hand. Okay, I see you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pray. Father, I, I just pray right now for these, for, for everyone that can hear my voice, but I pray for those that have said, I don't know where I stand with Jesus. Father, because what I know is that, that, that in that place there is no possibility of peace and truth and life. And so I pray that, Father, you would, you would tell them what you've done for them, the price you paid on the cross, and that in this moment you would call them to salvation. And that it's for your glory. Amen. Love, we're going to sing and we're going to worship. And if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you, to, it's entirely up to you, but I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. These men and women, more than anything, would love to talk to you about knowing Jesus. And so if you raise your hand, you may be in the middle of the aisle, they'll let you out. Just make your way down here. Grab any of these men and women by the hand and just say, I need to know Jesus. Would, would you be willing to do that? Would you come forward? And would you say, today I need to know Jesus? Respond as the Lord leads.